Yay, we are live. <laughs> Hi everyone. I feel like I need to just announce that we're live because uh, it's like you have Every to time. wait seconds for it to like <laughs> actually take effect. Of course, it's obvious to anyone watching that we are in fact live, but still, um, it's exciting all the same. So today I'm here with Lucy and we're going to be discussing Mansfield Park by Jane yeah, Austen. Sorry, this way. So, very exciting. I feel like we're going to have a lot to say about this one. And of course, as usual, I'm excited to hear what everyone who is watching also thinks about Mansfield Park. Um, but before we do, do you want to just like briefly introduce yourself, Lucy? Cool. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lucy from the channel The Book Bell. And yeah, I'm a massive Jane Austen fan. So when I found out Kira was doing this readathon, read along, sorry, I was like, all in basically yeah. any excuse to reread Jane Austen and I'm there so it's all good love it um well with that said I feel like this leads me perfectly on to how I like to start all of these live shows and that is to kind of have a bit of a general Jane Austen discussion kind of like a bit of your, your history of your relationship with Jane you know like how many times you've read her books if you have a favorite and um, it's just fun to hear I think so you go ahead Definitely. and tell me all about you and Jane <laughs> Exciting. Oh, well, me and Jane go way back. I'm not even kidding. Like, basically, I first read a Jane Austen book when I was like 13, 14. I read Pride and Prejudice. And that was because I saw the 2005 movie adaption with Keira Knightley. And I was like, so in love with it that I was like, okay, I need to read the book. And just became like weirdly obsessed with Pride and Prejudice that I think like most other people my age weren't. Um, and then I basically got all the books for Christmas and just binge read them all over the course of like a year and a half. Um, so that was my first time reading Jane Austen. But then I did English at university. I was like, obviously, I think lots of people who probably watch this channel probably do. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you obviously study Jane Austen like during uni and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So I've ended up actually rereading quite a lot of the books, like quite a lot. But my all-time favourite is, of course, Pride and Prejudice. Um, but I would say Persuasion and Mansfield Park are up there, like, for the number two position. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Bold. Right. I know. Bold. Unusual choices. <laughs> it is, yeah. I mean, Pride and Prejudice is, like, the classic choice. But I feel like Persuasion and Mansfield Park are probably generally speaking, two of the, like, less popular ones. So that is yeah. interesting. And I feel not that similar to Pride and Prejudice either like in the way that they're sort of like written mm. and the characters are sort of brought to life so and that's very interesting um I feel people probably will get bored of me saying this because I do talk about it in every live show but nonetheless um I have read all of Jane Austen's novels previously except for Mansfield Parks so that was my oh, first oh so now you've completed the set I have that's like amazing. I've officially done it which is exciting yeah. um I think the first man, uh, the first Mansfield Park, the first Jane Austen novel that I read was Northanger Abbey, um, mm. quite a few years ago now, um, and I do think Jane Austen just has such a lovely way of writing. Like in terms of yeah. classics, like she is, you know, not to be cliche, but she is like the classics author that I would recommend to anyone who doesn't think that they'll like classics because I think yeah. she, you know, it's like commercial fiction of its time so like they're very readable they're very fun um and easy to get into so I think you know as soon as I had read North End Grabby I knew that I kind of enjoyed her writing style but my mm. favorite is Emma and um, yet to I love um, Emma yeah to take her off of her pedestal which I think yeah. she would love as a protagonist so um yeah Emma is my favorite I need to like kind of now that I've read all six of them think about like my structure your ranking um, yeah which I think I'll probably do after I've like finished my rereads of the rest of them yeah so, of course we've got three more still to come but Emma is top spot so definitely that's, it's that's funny because I I peer ranked there's a video on my channel where I peer rank Jane Austen and I got so much stick for putting North and Garabi like bottom of the list which is so bad because like so many people love North and Garabi and it's like I think it is such a accessible book to get yeah. into Jane Austen um it's obviously like a bit shorter and I think like you know the kind of how it plays off the, the gothic tradition and it's a lot of fun but for yeah. some reason I've read that book only once and I haven't gone back yeah. to it so I feel like when it comes up for the reader read along 
I will be joining in definitely on Nor- Northern Grabby. Yeah, I'm excited to reread Northern Grabby because yeah. I mean, I've also only read it once. And I feel like I definitely remember enjoying it at the time. But equally, I don't feel like the characters are like as memorable as some of mm. her other characters. So, yeah, I do agree. I'm, I'm not sure where I'd put it. It certainly wouldn't be at the bottom for me, but it's not like top spot either. So, yeah. yeah. Um, anyone watching I'd love to hear if you have a favourite Jane Austen or you know a ranking system in place um, but yeah hello I'm also so glad that you could join I know um, welcome um, hi um, so now we've talked about general Jane Austen thoughts do you rank books I mean rate books rather like just before I dive into this next question I know some people don't rate books so yes I naturally, when I read a book, I'm like figuring out what star rating to give it in my head. And I'm quite traditional. I just give it a rating out of five. Yeah. Um, I don't know why that is. I think it's because I started off like with a blog and I actually did written book reviews. Yeah. So I think like I always write every single book that I read, which yeah. I think is getting probably a lot less common. I don't know. Like, well, I think know people how... definitely... I think there's always a fear of like offending an author who is like a yeah. current writer, which we obviously don't have to worry about with Jane Austen because she's never. I know we're safe. Read. She's never going to yeah. see our good read scores. She's not going to get angry at me. <laughs> my North and Garabi hate. Let's just say that. Um, but yeah, I do think you know sometimes it feels like an arbitrary score of like is that really reflective mm. of my whole experience but even yeah. still I like to give a book a score and then just kind of like talk about it in more depth elsewhere but I do like to give it a score so with that mm. said what is your score for Mansfield Park? So interestingly I would say on this go around because I, I think I previously rated it like five stars I oh, remember when I first read it I loved it now I would think maybe four stars um obviously we'll go into detail as to why um Um, but I think it's such a long novel and there's so many different components of the novel and different plot strands that I really love some of the plot strands but there are some plot strands that I absolutely hate that bring the star writing rating down for me 100%. I agree with that. I feel like it's it's always the case with any book that's a bit longer than like 300 pages. You know, it's like mm. they, they are going to have like areas that you like, areas that you don't like. And, it, you know, it's hard to have like a book that's of a significant length that you love the whole thing equally all the way through. So I feel like yeah. Four Stars is quite a fair rating. I What gave, about you? I gave it three stars. Okay. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Is my lowest rating for a Jane Austen novel. But I do mm-hmm. want to kind of defend it because I feel that three stars is, it's always like, I feel, I always used to be nervous when I used to do reading wrap ups to mm. say I was giving a book three stars because I feel like people take that as like, you hated the book. But actually, yeah, I, yeah, yeah definitely. You know, three stars is a, like a fair, Good writing. Like above yeah. average, you know, I, the way I look at that is like, enjoyed the reading experience, but I don't see myself raving about it or like really wanting to return to it like I feel like I'm probably quite Mm. satisfied with just the once around for this one yeah Um, yeah whereas Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice I gave both of them four stars because I Mm. I just felt like I vibed with them a bit more we'll obviously get into it a bit in in more depth of course as we go through but I gave it three stars um and anyone who also read it I'd love to know what you gave it so we have um oh that's interesting um and promising for you that you, that you might enjoy uh, North Angrabi more. Separately. Yeah, the rereads. A lot of people say this actually, like on the rereads, that North Angrabi is better. So that's really good to hear, Catherine. Yeah. I'm glad that you enjoyed it on the reread. That was my experience of Pride and Prejudice, actually. I really appreciate it. I feel like once you are familiar with the story, then the second time around, the humour is really what pops. So I feel like maybe that's why yeah. the rereads work so well for um, Jane mm. Then sure. Nice. I feel like, yeah, yeah, it is easy to give Jane Austen a lot of four and five stars because they're just such, like, lovely. They are so uplifting. Yeah, it's just a great time. Um, oh, look, we have a fan. Oh, hi, friend. Rebecca. She's my Love friend. It. That's kind of spoilery. Love it. <laughs> um, okay, ratings, two oh, out of five stars. stars. I agree on the least favourite 
Jane Austen for me personally but two stars that that is a rating where I'm like okay you really didn't enjoy it that much yeah. interesting um Persuasion is my favourite at Mansfield Park. Interesting. Interesting. Poor Mansfield Park, guys. I'm feeling like I have to defend this novel, which don't <laughs> worry, will come. <laughs> yeah, we'll have a nice little debate going on. We'll yeah, find. exactly. Um, okay. Oh, we have another, we have a fellow fan, a five out of five. Yay, fan. love uh, it. Good. Um, and Mansfield Park, oh, Persuasion and Pride and Prejudice. Mm. Yeah, this is a good point. Mansfield Park, whether it is your favourite or your least favourite, I think it does stand out against other Jane Austen. Yeah, novels, it's quite different. interesting, given that it's like her sort of middle novel, like mm. publication order. So it's like, it's not as if she started with a different style and then kind of like branched off into something else. She kind of like diverted and then yeah back to kind of like what she'd done in the first two with later ones so exactly okay let's gradually start moving into our discussion of Mansfield Park we'll start with some general unspoilery thoughts kind of just like general overview of plot kind yep. of and structure and then we'll dive into the uh you know the spoilers and feel free to keep popping ratings and comments on in the chat and we will you know get to them in a minute so That's do you have any like immediate thoughts that you feel you need to share with us yes yeah, so i actually want to touch base first on the character of fanny price who's obviously mm -hmm. our main character i think there are some spoilery things which i'll get into like later down the line but um yeah i think at first glance a lot of people upon reading mansfield park and i was guilty of it actually in this reread think that she is the worst of the jane austen heroines in the fact that She's not really got a lot going going on. You know, she's quite timid. She's quite shy. She's very, very reserved. And she lets a lot of people walk all over her. Mm -hmm. I think when you contrast her to a character like Emma or Jane or, or uh, Elizabeth Bennett, for example, yeah. it's hard to kind of root for Fanny. But <laughs> I think Fanny's character development is what actually makes this book for me because I'm not going to spoil anything at this stage, but over the course of the book, you really see her come into her own, kind of gain more, you know, kind of identity and more kind of confidence in who she is. And yeah. I really like that. I think like it's refreshing having a character who isn't just a feisty woman who kn who knows what she wants and is like quite vocal about it, you know, yeah. which I think a lot of Jane Austen's characters are um, yeah. kind of heroines. Um, but Fanny is a bit more reserved, but I think that's a good thing. I think there's probably going to be lots of people who do relate to Fanny. You know, we can't all be Elizabeth yeah. Bennett in this world, you know? So, yeah, um, no, I do agree. I think, so as I um, finish this book, a spoiler for my reading vlog, literally 15 minutes before this live show, <laughs> um, I, I went onto Goodreads and had a quick scroll through some reviews, and I saw quite a lot of people um, who were big fans of Fanny Price and they were like, yeah, mm. I really admired her qualities of her, like yeah. her being so like selfless and caring and quiet. And, you know, I, in my reading vlog, I was quite brutal to pull back. Were you? I feel like I was like, God, she's so boring. Um, and I yeah. felt like a bit more. I was a bit harsh, but to kind of like balance that out, like my favorite Jane Austen protagonist is Emma Woodhouse. I also oh. love Marianne from Sense and Sensibility, who is very like flamboyant and emotional and doesn't yeah. really sort of, like hold anything in. So I feel like I am just drawn to those more like chaotic energy characters. Whereas yeah. Fanny is like, I think you have to dig a bit deeper to like invest yourself in her. But equally, and we will definitely talk about this later mm. on, um, what you've sort of touched on, I think there are some really admirable qualities that she develops later on. Um, so yeah, I think she's she's harder to root for because she's like got a bit less personality, like a bit yeah less kind of like latch onto to begin with. Mm. But yeah, it develops certainly. So yeah. Um okay, let's see. Yeah, there's lots of exciting comments coming in. I can see everyone's opinions, which is great. Yeah, I see one person doesn't like Mansfield Park is the only one they don't like. That's interesting. Mm. Um, didn't dislike Fanny being a softer protagonist. I didn't like her because I disagree with the moral beliefs she holds. She was, yeah, I think that was it for me. So um, at certain points, and again, we'll talk on this more later, um, 
I found Fanny Price to be very, very similar to Jane Fairfax in Emma. Yes, yeah. She's got such a moral compass. Yeah, the whole reason Emma's like so eye rolly about Jane is like, oh, God, everyone's so bothered about Jane and Jane's so perfect and Jane's so. And I'm like, I really see that in Fanny. So it's interesting that, like, Mm. we, I think Jane Austen, she can, like, see both sides of a character really easily Mm. because she will have, like, you know, in certain novels that heroine who is like really outspoken and vocal about what they want and then have another character who they don't really like because they kind of represent the opposite of that whereas the opposite, this yeah. one, it's kind of the reverse which is interesting um mm. maybe the intro of north and gravity applies more to mansfield funny price wasn't born oh my god i love that that's so funny yes very very good it's um, true that is a really good that's one. hilarious great observation yeah no I, I agree i agree that's where i struggle with rating after my favorite which is obviously mm. emma um in case anyone didn't know um yeah. <laughs> like i find it hard to rank the other ones because they are mm. like so it's like a certain standard it's like there's no there's no bad jane austen book I yeah. think like everyone just has their favorites and exactly. but they're all great. Right. Come on, like it's also awesome. like I think it'll be interesting to kind of like continue rereading them throughout my life, and I'm sure mm. that it'll who change. I relate to more will be yeah. an ever evolving thing. Um, Definitely. I oh, see. That's nice. Yes, yeah, so I like, like that. It really probably does depend on like who you are and like how yeah. you see yourself responding in those situations. I also think like. I, I don't know I think I've got um firstborn child syndrome so I can be very like outspoken and glossy <laughs> and, like, very like yeah headstrong and like lead the pack whereas I feel yeah. like you know other people may be like a bit a bit less um of that and a bit more go with the flow and do what other people want can't relate definitely can I know <laughs> I also would love to meet someone who can like 100% relate to Lizzie because like I mean, she's just an icon, you know. Like, yes, I just yeah. don't think I can be that great. No, because like it. she's not just outspoken and headstrong. She's also like intelligent and reasoned. Mm. Whereas, like, I think Emma, she is just more relatable because she just like she is flawed. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I can get that. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, we have a Mansfield Park favorite. Yay. I'm liking liking these Mansfield Park fans coming out. <laughs> And this is interesting, yeah. I think obviously Jane Austen's novels are largely very like pastoral and not mm-hmm. all in a gothic setting. But you know, there's definitely a similarity to say like a, a Jane Eyre sort of character. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's a great comment. Really that's actually something I was going to. I'm going to go into later about Fanny. Is that I actually find it quite refreshing. Someone, a heroine in a Jane Austen novel who's not kind of middle class, like she comes from poverty and kind of when you go back to Southampton is it Southampton or Portsmouth? Portsmouth, Portsmouth. I, I think, think it's Port- that Portsmouth. There's Mansfield in Southampton or Northamptonshire. So it's Northamptonshire Hampton. I think <laughs> yeah I can't like oh yeah so she goes back to Portsmouth and obviously sees her family again but it's like the stark contrast between Mansfield Park and their kind of comfortable life compared yeah. to what Fanny actually came from so yeah. I, I really like that it's you know her character's different because she did come from that quite Absolutely, dark yeah. and it's like I suppose we have the very rich protagonists and then we have the characters like in Pride and Prejudice or like in um, Sense and Sensibility who mm. are you know they're pointed out as being less wealthy like they're not you know like living complete lives of luxury but yeah they're still sort of moving in those circles without having to worry about people thinking that they shouldn't be there. So yeah, interesting to yeah, see that protagonist who's coming from mm. the complete opposite end of the spectrum. And I think potentially, you know, that has a lot to say for like why she is the way that she is, because it's easy mm. to assume that someone like Emma Woodhouse obviously would be super confident and super yeah exactly that's about what she wants because what she wants is always within her grasp like you yeah. know there is, money is no object and so I mean obviously not to make this an Emma live show but she doesn't even have to think about marriage as like a social no because she is set for life essentially whereas someone like Fanny is like you know she's very much aware of her social status and that mm. her wants and needs always have to come second to those people who are more financially stable yeah. 
which means that she's probably like by default become meek and very like sort of flexible to other people's mm. needs because that's like the situation she has to be in so wow I've already yeah. been more sympathetic to her plight <laughs> I know I love it I also think like wow are her relatives rude like Mrs Norris is like oh, you know if she wasn't so mean I would kind of be like admiring of her just because she is so brutal and yeah. just awful She's it's hilarious horrible, like truly horrible I initially like on her introduction expected Mrs Norris to be like a Mrs Bennett kind of character yeah more, like um I can't remember who the lady is in Sense and Sensibility but it's like an older lady who's like yeah. I married off my daughter and now I'm just gonna yeah. like meddle in all of you young people's lives and like yeah they're funny and they're outspoken and they are sometimes mean but it always seems like in good humor whereas mm. Mrs Norris just felt like mean-spirited and yeah. cruel for no reason mm. um I, I really despise her like oh my god awful yeah awful. absolutely definitely it's yeah it's a tricky one and funnily enough it's kind of like with um Sir Thomas who's obviously the head of the Bertram household at yeah. first I think you really want to dislike him because he's kind of like you know, at the start of the book, he basically says, like, oh, I'd be worried about Fanny joining the household in case, like, Edmund and her, like, fall in love um, and something happens. But actually, he turn- he really surprises you by, by the end of the novel and kind of sees yeah. Fanny, a daughter, the daughter that he obviously yeah. didn't <laughs> find he had. So, yeah, I really, like, grew to love Sir Thomas. And yeah, I, I think he this- saw the good things in Fanny. I think his and Fanny's growth were kind of like on parallels, like where, yeah. you know, she grew into herself and in her sort of becoming more of like a confident and just like self-assured woman, but still like very moral guided. Mm. He kind of then grew to appreciate her and his own like growth kind of mirrored that. Yeah. Felt like it yeah. was really nice. Like, it's nice to see non-romantic relationships explored within mm. her novels as well um, and I, I did really enjoy that one so yeah you're right I also felt like uh, Mrs Bertram was like you know I didn't love her but by the end I was like oh she's all right I suppose like, yeah she had a bit of growth towards the end um I like the growth. Growth. exactly it was very selfishly motivated in terms of like she realized that she couldn't do without Fanny rather than mm. like actually valuing her as a person yeah but still for sure. um okay so I think that's probably kind of as much as we can really say without spoilers so yeah, all the spoiler warning, glory fair warning guys anything from this point onwards is fair game so if you've not read Mansfield Park and you don't want spoilers then maybe come back to this later but if you have which I assume a lot of people have then let's yeah. dive into it so where to start okay. where to start indeed I think we have to talk about the Crawfords like can we please talk about the wow. Crawfords the Crawfords okay so Henry oh yeah He's another oh my one. God. I think him yeah. and Mrs. Norris were two characters who you could just tell that their intentions were never good. Like mm. in some of Jane Austen's other novels, there are characters who you start to like be able to tell they're bad, like you have um Willoughby in Sense of Sensibility, yeah. or maybe you have like a Frank Churchill in mm. Emma, and you see like, oh, they are charming at first and then you kind of like figure out that they're not so good whereas mm. I felt like that about Henry from the start like I could just tell mm. it was a bad egg so yeah what do you think yeah I think you're right like comparing him to those other like kind of often rakes I guess you could call them <laughs> like what's interesting is like even Wickham in Pride and Prejudice is yeah. like he has motives you know, for wanting to be such a awful person. Like, he obviously is worried about his financial status and obviously mm-hmm. grew up in, like, the Darcy household, knowing all this kind of so close to wealth but not truly having it. So you can almost see that with him. You understand why he's turned so mm-hmm. out so bad. With Henry Crawford, like, there is no excuse. He is a, a wealthy man. Like, 
he can have anything he wants but I think that's almost like what makes him such a good yeah, villain yeah. because it's like like the world is his playground exactly and his yeah and these people as things to be played with and then mm. drop and obviously yeah. he kind of gets his comeuppance which we will talk about but it's like a little bit too little too late I think he just yeah. is it's very immature I thought it was kind of interesting that at first they kind of like mentioned how like he's not classically good looking yeah not tall and handsome and then like people are kind of like allured by his personality and mm. then like, through that they come to view him as like this handsome character which I thought was interesting like because he's not got like that immediate charm and then it kind mm. of grows on people but I suppose the first place that he kind of like comes in is with the kind of divide between Julia and Maria. Um, yeah. And like they're both basically in love with him, which I think is very interesting. How did you kind of feel about that? Yeah, I find that I found that whole dynamic quite understandable, I think, because like I think Maria's obviously seen as like the eldest and you know, she's got Mr. Rushworth, this kind of marriage that's been arranged for her. Like, you know, the whole family is expecting big things out of her kind of marriage. Yeah. So I feel like with Maria, it's more of a temptation to stray because like, you know that that marriage isn't probably the best if she was to get with Henry Crawford. Yeah. You know, Mr. Mr. Rushworth is like the expected path for her. But then it's kind of like, you know, it kind of represents like that temptation of deviating mm. from your set path. And with Julia, I think it's classic, like, this is going to, I hope I don't offend any of the second children out there, but <laughs> pure second daughter syndrome, where it's like, I want what my, my elder sister has, you know, like, I want to, I want them to look at me and whatever. Yeah. But I find that dynamic really interesting. And then obviously what Julia ends up doing is like, even like both of them just turn out to screw over their lives you know so Literally. I didn't expect like, that from Julia but no little foresight like yes like they have no consideration for their own futures which I think is so interesting mm. um I think the whole trio of them you know Julia Maria and Henry is yeah so hilarious to watch because it's like that neither of them, I, I think, really actually necessarily want Henry, nor does he no. want them. But he wants the sister that he knows he can't have. Meanwhile, mm. he also wants the other sister to love him because he takes great pleasure in knowing that people want him. And then yeah. Maria, like you say, only wants him because it represents like the the forbidden fruit basically like yeah not meant to go down which obviously makes it more enticing and then it's just such an ironic little play of people where it's just like you know that none of them actually want to be with them and that they would not make each other happy no yet, through pure like jealousy and I guess maybe just like they're just intrigued about what could be mm -hmm. they go for things that are just not not right for them at all um and I think it's very funny to watch it play out for sure I also think you don't feel bad watching or at least I didn't feel bad watching Julia and Maria kind of be fooled by Henry and taken along for a ride by him because they weren't particularly nice characters and like they no. you know even though I've said I think Fanny is a bit of a boring protagonist you see that she's like a good person and so yeah. when you see these other characters who are so mean to her and who are rude about her situation I don't feel bad when anything bad happens to them because I'm like mm. it's kind of what they had coming so they had it coming from the start yeah. exactly um I think like also it's like Henry Crawford and Mary Crawford like what a pair like <laughs> wow I think like Mary Crawford is one of those I find her even more almost of a villain than yeah. Henry Crawford because like she has charmed everyone like she honestly like the friends Fanny like it's so nice to her like and does things for her like you know giving her that chain for like her the cross that her brother awesome. got her like she's very kind to Fanny and kind of like takes her under her wing and yeah. then she also with her relationship with Edmund like is very like bantery and playful and you know of course she seemed utterly bewitching but then at the end of the day she is just a bad person yeah and you're kind of swept up in that along the way you kind of root for Mary even though yeah, you know she's yeah. awful 
So here was my thoughts on Mary. I did say at a certain point when I was reading, I was like, okay, I actually think she might be my favourite character because I think in terms of Jane Austen and her writing style, she had that perfect balance of like, you can tell that she's not entirely good, but she's also got that kind of like outspoken personality Mm. type that makes her funny to watch, but it doesn't feel like completely motivated by evil intentions whereas like with Henry yeah. and Mr. Morris you just feel that everything they do is bad so it kind of takes the humour out of it mm. whereas like you know I just feel like Mary had a bit more of that balance which made her a likeable character and like a nice counterbalance to like the goodness of Fanny and mm. Edmund so I feel like because you see the three of them together a lot it is a nice yeah. balanced dynamic so I really liked Mary in terms of how what she contributes to the plot mm. not as like oh yeah she's a great like, character yeah um, and I do think it's interesting because it plays with you a lot and you feel as a reader kind of like how I assume Edmund in particular would have felt in his mm. relationship with Mary because at first you sort of see oh she's a bit outspoken they're probably not a very good match and then she kind of like mellows it back and you know obviously from the outside perspective you can see that every time she's nice to Fanny it is manipulative and it's mm. calculated because she recognizes the value that Edmund places on Fanny and so yeah. she is being nice to him her rather to please yeah. him and you kind of see yeah. like it's all very calculated and Fanny is aware of that I feel but like mm. as a reader you kind of like you you start to think oh maybe she is a bit nicer and then you're like you know is it even that bad if she's only being nice to Fanny because she wants to please Edmund because it's, it's all like, someone you know, else. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's like she's still being nice to her. But then at mm. certain points, it kind of goes over to the yeah. other side. It's like a bit too far. So I just think you really are like toyed around by her. And it's like mm. an interesting experience, probably the most easy to get invested in because you, you don't know what to expect from her. Yeah. I always love reading like her themes. And I think she's very, yeah, I like how outspoken she is and kind of. She's almost like a very modern woman, I guess, like in, in obviously Regency times. Whilst I think Fanny is very traditional, um, especially with her more m- like moral values. Um, yeah. Whilst I think Mary is a bit more like modern and, you know, she's very like flirtatious and the stuff she says about like the fact that Edmund obviously wants to be a clergyman, she is so brutal it's like what so are you against people joining the priesthood like let him live his life you know she's literally like she teases him because I think she really believes that if she makes it out to be so ridiculous even like if she's like pretends it's all in jest we know she believes it like truly so then you yeah. kind of like she really thinks that if she teases him enough about it he'll change his mind but obviously it doesn't work out that way but she's like mm. really harsh about it like to the point where she's like well I'll dance with you now because I'll never dance yeah. with you <laughs> brutal honestly like, love it husband, broken hearted um, I know I feel like a really great section of the novel that I think really starts to like open up all of the characters is when they decide to put on a play I think oh love is vows yeah that is one of my favorite sections because I just think it brings out everyone's personalities so Mm. well and I found the like discussion of comedy versus tragedy and then once they'd like on that then like the debate on like which one to choose was just so funny to see it play out um and then this was where I really went off Fanny and Edmund because I'm mm. like all these other characters are just gonna have a fun time put on a play and the like piety of the two of them like oh my god yeah so immoral to put on a play I'm like come on guys let's <laughs> have a bit of fun like it's Fanny. okay no one's gonna get in trouble but like I just found that to be such a revealing section of mm. the novel which I just loved that's interesting you say that I think I hadn't I didn't look at it like the fact that it revealed personalities but it really does like having thought about it now you've said that yes it really does I was just about to say that I hate that section I don't oh know why God. I just find that it drags and I remember like reading it the first time and just being like what is this play like I'm just not on board and then rereading it I'm like yep yeah, still not into the play I don't know why yeah. I just feel like if it's inevitable it just like 
oh my god Mr Rushworth and his like however many speeches I'm just like I can't just it's too much he has like 40, 40 speeches or something like that I know um, no, so I do agree. it does go on a bit long like the back and forth and Edmund trying to talk them out of it over and over yeah like it is a bit longer than it needs to be but the mm. essence of what it does for me in terms of like revealing those characters I really enjoyed and like the length to which Mary goes to to try and include yeah Edmund in it is like she really wants him but um mm. It's very, very interesting. So I like that. Um, yeah. What do you think of the potential for Edmund and Mary as a couple? See, I, if Mary wasn't just like so like awful by the end, and obviously I think the clergyman comments aside, like, you know, I think it never would have worked because of the fact that she's so against that. Yeah. And she, you could really tell that that's something that Ed, Edmund was really passionate about. Mm -hmm. And you could tell that her liking Edmund was almost like more of a she liked the idea of him I think and more she than liked, actually liked who he was the concept of like how much could she make him like her enough to change mm. what she wanted from him so yeah exactly but on the flip side they do say opposites attract and like they could probably bring stuff out of each other like I think Mary could probably make Edmund a little bit less like pious as you said mm. and like but on the flip side like Edmund could probably soften her up a bit and make her less yeah you know superficial maybe um yeah. so yeah yeah no I agree I think realistically they probably wouldn't have ever worked however mm. I think interestingly you know in most of Jane Austen's novels the protagonist is the person whose romantic pursuits we kind of like follow throughout the entirety of the book yeah Whereas in this one, actual romance of Fanny doesn't happen until much, much later on in the novel. Mm. Whereas the potential for Edmund and Mary to sort of kick off is much more of a focus throughout the novel. And yeah, like, that's so true. I just think it was interesting. And I, I was kind of rooting for them, partially because mm. I knew the alternative was Edmund and Fanny. And like, <laughs> you weren't I, on board really, with that. I could not get on board with it from like a a moral point of view. Was it like the cousin thing? The cousin yeah. thing. But also, like, in their relationship with each other, I felt like, so she was very close also to her brother, William, and I felt mm. like she treated William and Edmund very much the very same. Very similar. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, that's a really good point. Grew up together, you know, she moved into yeah. the apart when she was 10, and I, I feel like they had a very sibling-like relationship, and I'm like, mm. I know, obviously, context of the times and all that kind of stuff, like, it wasn't the same as if now, like, someone wrote a book about cousins getting married, but still, I just was not on board with it, because I just yeah. thought, oh, really? So... I think that made me root for Mary and Edmund more because I was like, a little I bit more. Like yeah, I think you're right. It's also, I think this is one of like the critical what a lot of critics say about it. But like, mm -hmm. the romance isn't really there. Like, especially as you were saying that Fanny doesn't really have a romance plot until towards the end of the book. But yeah. any romance between her and Edmund is very non-existent. And the only mm -hmm. time I feel that Edmund truly looks at Fanny as like a romantic. With a, um, with a romantic interest is when Mary Crawford said that thing after dancing with him and then he kind of sulks off and you know so it's yeah, kind of like oh what so Fanny's like second choice like she's not, yeah he's, she is like the sort of like amiable you know character who is just like you know easygoing and they have like mm. this obvious sense of companionship but I'm like yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean you need to get married you could just be close cousins you know exactly so, yeah I agree like I don't think it never really dived into attraction and romance and mm. spark it was more so like a slow burn but I don't think it necessarily does enough to convince you of a romantic spark yeah me. but the other um romantic possibility for Fanny was of course in the horrible Henry um mm. Henry. <laughs> so love it um, someone has written a comment which I think really ties in to what we're going to say about Henry. So, most of Jane Austen's villains are narcissists and Fanny was the mm. only one who doesn't fall for their game. And this is where, so, 
at the point where they were doing the play is the point where Fanny was the lowest in my opinion because I oh yeah like, you're so boring like lighten up <laughs> I'm not gonna kill you to do a play I know um, and I just I was so over it because I think what you say even though I liked how it revealed those characters it was long so I just was so bored of her and mm. Edward like, going on about it um so that was where she was the lowest in my estimations where she was the highest in my estimations was where Henry was trying to sort of sway her and everyone in her life from With all day, different yeah. animals and obviously everyone is like socially higher than her were mm. trying to convince her that she was wrong to turn him down and she was so steadfast in her like denial that it was the right thing to do and she was mm. like I, I really can't do it I don't care it would not be right and I was just like you know at that point as well she was the highest in my opinion because I think it was just yeah interesting like in every other Austin book that I've read, they're swayed by that wrong one. And then they eventually see the error of their ways. But in this mm. one, she saw through people the whole way. Yeah, so quickly. I yeah. It's very interesting. And perhaps, again, is like a symptom of her not being from their class. So she kind of like mm. you know, sees things from a different angle, perhaps, than yeah. you know, people who've always kind of been around that kind of nonsense. So maybe yeah. that's why but that's yeah really interesting to, I think that's like spot on in terms of like that makes sense why she can see through that because I think like you know you can tell how much Henry Crawford is putting it on I guess like you know with Julian and Maria like they fell for everything like they kind of you know were waiting on his every word but well, I think with Fanny like she just <laughs> yeah exactly I know um but yeah, I think the thing with Henry and Fanny, it's like, you kind of like, it's exciting that finally there's some romance, like that mm -hmm. he is like wooing her and wants to marry her. And it's like, you want to let yourself fall for it, but that's yeah. quite a clever mm -hmm. advice, I guess, from Jane Austen. It's like, you realistically, like you want to fall for it. But then of mm -hmm. course, Fanny has this amazing, judgment and can see through that and knows that it's the wrong thing to do so yeah I do appreciate I think you're right like she definitely grows on you and she grows as a character throughout the book and by the end of the book I feel like she is a lot more self-assured um yeah. but yeah yeah I think you know she anchors you as a reader I think because in the other ones you know Marianne for example she falls for the mm. wrong guy she falls for Willoughby and like you as the reader you're like swayed by this romance because it's all just like so enticing and exciting and yeah. then you kind of like have to fall with her and realize the error of your ways whereas mm. Fanny she kind of like you still kind of want it to happen but she kind of like keeps you anchored she's like you know she is like the ballast keeping us all steady yeah exactly because <laughs> I think you know obviously the way that it goes down is very interesting and it's a really I think probably the best formed part of the novel so Henry comes mm. back to Mansfield and he specifically says to Mary I'm gonna make Fanny Price yeah. with me so you immediately know there is like ill intent in his actions mm. and so at first you're very guarded and you're like well, it's not going to work because we all know Fanny as a character and we all know how much she despised him and his actions towards her cousins. So it starts like that. And then you realise that he genuinely starts to have feelings for her. Yeah. So I think that's the point where you as the reader start to soften a little bit and you're like, mm. maybe her goodness is rubbing off on him. On him. In the same way that you think maybe that could happen between Edmund and Mary and they could kind of like mm. balance each other out so I think when he is like very consistently like trying to win her over you start to think oh I wish that she would give him a chance mm. but obviously Fanny knows best and Fanny, it, Fanny was right all along she falls she was right and I think like you say so someone asked us to comment on the growth and development of her and I think this is like the key point of her growth yeah. and development because you see that she is so always so keen to please her relatives and to do what they want her to do because she's very grateful to them and the position that they've given her but when her you know her uncle comes in and is like he's asked for your hand in marriage I think you should do it yeah and like, no and he 
immediately criticizes her character and says his estimations of her were all wrong and he mm. really like tears her to shreds of it and she mm. still is like no I genuinely can't do it and I think that's where you're like okay she is very you know she does what people want her to do to an extent but when it comes to sort of like issues of her own morality and to her marrying someone mm. that, other than love is an issue of morality I think that's yeah. where the line is drawn and I think it's you see like that she has a strength that maybe she wouldn't have had earlier in the novel mm. yeah definitely I think also just like watching him play with like Maria and Julia to that extent as well I think there's always going to be like a level of distrust and yeah. I think he, you know even despite the fact that he you know had real feelings for Fanny towards the end I think like knowing and obviously the truth all comes out that he's just a scoundrel but thank god she didn't marry him because I know you know like it could have happened to any of uh, Jane Austen's other protagonists I think yeah. it would have like I really do think like if this would have been Marianne and Willoughby and he would have been so adamantly asking for oh, yeah. her to marry him she'd have been straight there she'd have been at the church married and I then, know yeah you know <laughs> in this you know in this world in this universe like marriage is it like once you've done it you've done it and like you can't just go off and like remarry and things like that so I feel like it's you know it's like a big thing so I think she is very strong to have like resisted mm. the potential for social climbing I guess because ambition yeah, exactly is it such a key thing for a lot of her other characters and mm. you know lesser characters who've had less room to grow I guess like um who've had to climb not as high because they've already had mm. that elevated status would have gone for it so it's like the fact that she recognized that she was sort of potentially limiting her life to just being at like, that level yeah that level. and she never yeah. would yeah, she still she still was like it's the right thing for me because he's not the right guy for me. So I think that was yeah. Really I do really like that. I know, and that That's is what I think makes her stand out against any yeah. Jane Austen's other protagonist for me. Yeah, definitely, and kind of like she reminds me of Lizzie Bennet in like a way there because obviously like you parallel that with the Mister Collins situation where Lizzie was just like absolutely not not marrying him, <laughs> even though it would give her entire family security and it would mean that the house would stay within the family mm. you know Lizzie held on to her own morals and her own standing for herself and she just yeah. didn't accept that marriage and it's kind of like a similar situation like Fanny would have been able to provide for her wider family but you know she knew that that would just not be the right thing to do yeah um, it was like striking that balance between doing what's right for you doing what's right for the family and also mm. following like your moral compass and I think yeah. there are like certain things that she would do and put other people above herself but in the situation of marriage I think she just viewed that as too important of a life decision so yeah exactly team Fanny love it <laughs> she's great um what's interesting though is I was thinking this like I don't know if anyone else else has had these thoughts but cousins aside I was like, you know what? Fanny would actually be quite good with Tom. I personally, yeah, like, I think if she would have been for any of the cousins. Yeah. That would, that would have been, been such an exciting romance as well. Yeah. There would yeah. have been far more, like, at stake because he was obviously the heir of yeah. the family and all the sibling. I also think um, that it would have made a lot more of an interesting thing for Mrs Norris mm. and her opinions on the situation because she would have been yeah. outraged at that and I think I do think Fanny and Edmund are too similar like way too similar they lot, are very similar yeah a lot of her other matches in other novels kind of have that like you know pride and prejudice you've got Lizzie mm. and Mr Darcy they're similar but they also are different and they kind of like bring yeah. out the best in each other and that's the same in a lot of her other novels you have like the romance forces the characters to grow whereas I feel like Edmund and Fanny are already so similar mm. it's like living in like a really boring moral echo chamber for a yeah like you just aren't excited by a potential sequel obviously Jane Austen isn't alive but like yeah you know like what what's their happy ever after going to look like it just doesn't seem as exciting but yeah. yeah so like it would have been more interesting if they maybe would have developed that relationship a bit more and had kind of like yeah bring out the 
like a more lively side of Fanny and equally maybe mm. her to like mellow him down a little bit. Um, yeah. Interesting point. Mary and Tom, I think, are oh, a, more, wow. okay. a more likely combination. Yeah, again, sure. Is it like a bit too much of the same? Like, are they too similar to mm. each other to kind of work mm. Um, but what's also, I think Tom needs that like Tom yeah Tom needs that like mellowing out because he's just like so such a mess that he almost needs like Fanny's like more reasonable moral yeah. you know to kind of like like you say like to bring the opposites out of each other mm -hmm. it's very interesting I'm so gonna write the fan fiction I'm gonna do it <laughs> please do I'll read it um but yeah, oh, I think, you know what was interesting like I suppose I was I never quite, although I said I was I was invested in, in Mary and Edmund as a potential couple, I couldn't quite see what she like saw in him because she mm. also like, you know, there's a point towards the end of the novel where she's like becomes a lot more invested in Edmund because they think that Tom might die and oh yeah he will become the heir. And so obviously there's like a financial gain there, but I wonder like if that was what she really cared about, why she didn't try and pursue Tom in the first place. Mm. that's a really good point actually because at first she does like Tom but then yeah. Tom goes away for quite a while but I worry yeah I don't really know because like what's her game plan there yeah maybe she maybe she had no intention of actually marrying Edmund maybe it was yeah. like Henry Crawford maybe it was just a game and she just wanted that yeah. attention and, and kind of adoration of country versus Ooh, yeah so definitely. mary and, and henry kind of represent the city a little bit more and that's kind of like mm. why they feel more comfortable and they've kind of come to the countryside and potentially it's all just a bit of a holiday for them a bit of like a fun time and yeah potentially mm. it's like how much havoc can we wreck while we are in the countryside that's and then we'll, so like, true yeah that's, that's a great that's comment quite possibly you're right maybe she never really intended to mm. marry anyone from the country and she was just having a bit of fun and seeing what you know they both were kind of seeing how far they could push the boundaries which was very interesting. exactly I think that's a good uh, point on the country city kind of comment though because um mm. the only like the loc in terms of location we are at Mansfield for most of the book which unlike Jane Austen's other books maybe apart from Emma although Emma still goes like out and about to like Bob yeah. Hill and wherever she but like she has jaunts all the time but like we are solely I would say apart from like the trip to Southerton and um when we go to Portsmouth mm. that's it like we're in Mansfield the whole time so it's quite a obviously a lot happens but it's quite a yeah. like quite a small location to set an entire small. book social circle as well mm. same as it's a longer book like there's not really a huge amount of like balls and suitors no. and, you know there's not actually like that much going on so it could kind of mm. it makes sense when characters like Henry and Mary come in who are used to a bit more of like a lively setting that they yeah. kind of have their fun because it's like the only source of amusement that they have so like the people exactly. are their playthings which is very interesting mm. um okay so Ooh, I'm interested to hear what you think about this because someone Ooh. doesn't view Fanny as a kind person. That's interesting. I um I can see where this I can see where this is going actually because one thing I do pick up on when reading, you know, when I read the novel was that Fanny is very quick to judge mm -hmm. and often like her first judgments, that's it. Like she doesn't really give anyone a time of day after she's made that initial judgment so yeah. I think like you know that's very true like does she have like an innate kindness where mm. you know she makes these snap judgments especially with like Henry Crawford who obviously she was right all along but you know she was always very almost rude to him like barely saying yeah. anything to him he was obviously hands, going really. out of his way yeah to help like to speak to her she even with Mary Crawford who on the surface if you're just looking at it like pretend we're there and Mary Crawford's just doing all these like kind of nice things like fair enough it might come from a selfish place and that she's trying to prove to Edmund you know she's trying to get Edmund to kind of look upon her favorably whatever yeah. but she's still being nice to Fanny and Fanny's very much like 
especially that gold chain scene, like before the ball. Fanny's like, oh, I, you know, if someone else gave me the chain, I'd love that. But because Mary gave me it, like, yeah. it, it kind of isn't as great. And it's kind of yeah. like, she's doing a nice thing for you. So I do understand this comment. No, I agree. I At first I was like, no, I think she probably is kind. But actually, when you dig into it, it's like a combination of factors. Like, is mm. she an innately good person I think yes she is but for what reason like I think mm. she wants to do the right thing and she lets that desire to never be seen to have done something wrong yeah for her actions which might mean acting kindly to people but actually it's like all because of how much emphasis she places on morality and doing the right thing and so it's not necessarily like kindness because that's she's like a good-hearted person it's kind of like no. I need to do the right thing and that's kind of like the the main like sort of motivation behind what she's doing and I think also you say like she is that sort of emphasis that she placed on her own morality does come across in the judgments that she makes about mm. her so like I think I don't think she loses her kindness necessarily but I think mm. her worldview is built around morality and so yeah she would probably view associate like she'd kind of see herself as guilty by association if she was mm. nice to Henry because she would view him as immoral and then herself yeah. con like by association so yeah very interesting mm. look at it for it's sure debate, exactly mm -hmm. I think morality is probably you know it comes into all of her novels but I think probably in this one the most it's like mm. it's very much guiding everything yeah. is sort of in Fanny's life which is very interesting mm. um yeah I think this is this is true I think we do see oh yeah in Fanny probably like she is struggling with her own opinions because she probably mm. recognizes that a lot of her view of Mary is colored by like you say her jealousy because she sees her as like a another person vying for Edmund's attention mm. and so I think she is probably more torn on how she feels about Mary, whereas in her view of Henry, I think she's always completely set. Like, she knows that he's bad, and that's the decision she's made. I think with Mary, we see it tip the scales a lot more, like, where she yeah. kind of feels one way and then another, and it's a bit more varied, so. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Um well, that's interesting. I think we obviously don't know much about Mary's upbringing. Like, we don't Yeah. a huge insight to that other than, like, a little bit of background. But, like, because we don't really ever get to know her, you know, like, the people that bring her up, we don't mm. really know her. Whereas with Tom, I don't think that's a very fair point because there are four siblings there who've all been brought up in the same house and, you know, three of them are quite rubbish and then there's one yeah like how, what, who raised Edmund like what no. angel <laughs> he was raised by himself he's that good that he could just do it all himself I know exactly um, it's, so, it's bizarre yeah when you think of that absolutely um not most redeemable like I don't think either of them are like terrible characters I no. think like you say, they're the two that are the most balanced and potentially most realistic in the sense mm. that they, are, they have both you know redeemable qualities and then yeah both are, like not so great and they just have this like great balance of like mm. being selfish being self-motivated but also doing things that kind of help other people and I just think it's um yeah like, they have moments of kindness yeah exactly I yeah. think they're also like very like you need characters in the book like that because it's exciting you know mm. like I think all the stuff Tom gets up to and you know all his kind of like he's just a bit of a, a, bit of a mess and then Mary yeah. of course I think you know I agree I think she's probably one of the better the best characters out of the entire novel because like she's so complex and like you you really can't guess what her motivations are a lot of the time and I think that's really interesting like she yeah. is a standout character I'd say really is yeah I think of all the mm. characters she's kind of the one that will like stick with you throughout the whole thing like you're interested mm. in what you're going to do because she's not predictable and I think in this novel in particular Jane Austen has kind of covered all the bases in the sense that we yeah. have like on a scale of morality we have like these really horrible really immoral characters we have these 
perfect, like absolutely moral characters. And then we have those ones that kind of fall in the middle who are, you know, constantly like swaying between the two. And I feel like in those characters, there is the most to relate to as readers. Um, yeah. Especially, I think there's modern readers who are obviously not going to be like so guided by morality and, you know, like the church and things like that as like... Yeah people like we'll root for um, them exactly yeah yeah, it's fun um yeah I think Mm. there is obviously like a huge distinction between you know the good and the bad in those characters which is interesting yeah I think you know of all of them probably Maria is like the least likable in her actions um she doesn't yeah. care for her own sister even like she's very no. motivated mm. um julia i think you can feel bad for because i feel like she, like say she's like that second sister less desirable yeah. than her older sister because of like you know just that status that comes with not being the oldest and i just feel like she is easier to sympathize with um mm. Tom, i think is just like a fun character and i, I like yeah and then Edmund, I know you were meant to like him, but he's probably one of my least favourite characters because I'm just he's like... He's not very fun, is he? Yeah. He's not fun. I think he's sweet. He he's sweet, nice but him. he's just not fun. Yeah. yeah. Like, I just think he's like, he's like Fanny, but with Fanny, you can feel bad for her because of the circumstance that she's in, whereas mm. he doesn't have that level of sympathy required. So it's like, what's the purpose of him? That's yeah. I know there is purpose, but like, he is just annoying it's annoying yeah it's just I think it's that kind of like holier than thou attitude and very like just the goodness I know like you know like you say I think like people would have found that attractive probably at that time but I don't know I don't know I liked how he stood up for Fanny though I think like that's actually something that you know actually redeemed his characters like throughout the whole thing he is on funny side like he mm-hmm. apart from the times when he accidentally neglects her for Mary but like you know most of the time he's like standing up for her he's like no Fanny should go along to this dinner that we're doing and he always advocates for her so it's yeah. kind of like lovely to see that and in those moments you really do root for Edmund because it's like he's the only one who actually notices mm-hmm. her for who You're she so is right. as a person. you are so right and that's just made me think, you know, I wonder if Edmund wasn't in the picture. So, like, if mm. there was only three Bertram siblings and Fanny turned up at Mansfield Park and was kind of thrown into the lion's den, essentially, mm. what character she would have ended up being? Because she, you know, is, is treated kindly by Edmund right at the beginning of her, like, journey to yeah. the park, basically. And then I, I feel like she mirrors him a lot you know in her morality Mm. conducts herself and I wonder how much of that was like innate to Fanny as a character and how much of that was kind of like modeled on Edmund that's interesting yeah and like Mm. maybe he wasn't around like I wonder if she would have ended up being a different kind of person which is marrying Henry Crawford there's yeah, another, uh, word. another <laughs> fan fiction to write. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's interesting, actually. Yeah, I haven't thought of it like that. Maybe she does mirror Edmund, which makes yeah. it even more, like, creepy that they end up together if she kind of takes so much of her personality Personal. from yeah. that. Because it's like, she doesn't come across as someone, like, at least at the beginning of the book, mm. someone with a very strong sense of self. So it's like, yeah, I think she kind of like yeah she is a, a mirror to the person that she admires the most and so mm. it's very interesting. it's just interesting though because like he was the first person to pay her kindness mm. so it's like and then you know he's like the only person that she falls in love with I don't know mm. I don't know she you could pick this novel apart basically you really could like, a spe- like if you really dive into their relationship and like look at how it progresses like I think it would be very interesting to do it would take ages but mm. I think you could see a lot of interesting things there because it's just like, like you say, he's the first person to show her kindness, potentially the only person really to show her true kindness yeah. for a long time. And so she immediately associates him with good. And so mm. his automatically is good. And therefore, if she wants to be good, she needs to be like him. And so that's yeah. he ended up as like 
female Edmund, basically. Exactly. Um, so a bit more disturbing. Very interesting. But they end up together. I know. <laughs> so, I suppose we're probably coming towards the end, seeing that it's been over an hour, but I think a final thing to discuss is the rapid su- succession of events as oh my God, yeah. the ending kind of like transpires because it's quite a slow burn novel until mm. last few chapters and then it's like boom 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 so much is happening so yeah. it kind of picks off with Tom being ill which of the events is probably the least interesting but it kind of brings yeah. about Fanny's return to Mansfield Parks so it's mm. important in that sense but then we have what transpires between Maria and Julia and classic old Henry coming oh, back. Oh, Henry, yeah. Showing classic. his true colours. So having just read Pride and Prejudice, where, of course, we have Lydia and her sort of elopement. and yeah, running classic off, elopement. It was interesting to see. We had kind of like a bit of both here. So we had Julia mm. elope with Yates, and that was kind of like a bit dramatic, but it wasn't that important really it's like well mm. she's married now so it, it doesn't really matter she just probably made a big mistake in terms of like yeah. you know her future but then we have married maria aka mrs rushworth just running yeah another man Could it's she- crazy and i actually think that's the most scandalous of like <sighs> any other jane austen novel i think like in the context of like the time Mm-hmm. You know, elopements are scandalous enough, but then you put in, you know, basically a, a marital affair, and it's like shocking. Well, you know, the elopement in Pride and Prejudice with Lydia is shocking. I think because she's so young, and it's like she's throwing away her future and potentially ruining her sister's potential for marriages as well. So it's like mm. it feels intense. But actually, she wasn't married yet, and so all she was doing was signing herself up to be married to this man forever. And like yeah. as long as they got married, all would be well. And it obviously worked out fine. But with this one, to have decided to marry another man, to spite Henry, is the reason that Maria marries Mr. Rushworth, because she's like, I'm not mm. gonna let him think that he's got the better of me. Because her dad gives her an out. Like he's like I can't believe that. Yeah, that's like one of the best scenes in the novel. Like like he's wow. like are you, are you sure that you want to marry this man because I don't think you do and she's like no I do and she does it and then of course regrets it so she made a decision based on spite lived to regret it but like that is scandal like to have left your husband mm. for another man is like the most scandalous thing that has happened in the Jane Austen novel I wasn't expecting it from this one in particular like, I know Wow. Maybe it was just like you know, all the kind of slow, slow development and everything, and then it's just like the drama at the end. I must say though, like that's the one, the one of the few criticisms I have about Mansfield Park is the ending. But I think Jane Austen pulls it off in such an incredible way. Let me find the chapter mm-hmm. um, where. So it's actually my favorite line of mm-hmm. any Jane Austen book, and it is, "Let other pens dwell on guilt and misery. I quit such odious subjects as soon as I can." And it's like, she's just like, you know, this is enough drama for one day. Let's go back onto the happier stuff. Yeah. I just love that. But equally, I'm just like, the ending is so abrupt that it's just yeah. tied in a kind of bow and that's it. He does also at some point, I think, say like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give you a time frame here. I'm just gonna let you decide. Like, I can't remember exactly how she phrases it, but it's with yes. Edmund and Fanny and she's like, I'm not going to say exactly when it was, but you decide yeah. because it's different for everyone. And then when like a sufficient time had passed, um, yes, I think it's like just after that line that you said. And yeah, I think I know me, which one you're talking about. Um, well, let me see if I can find it. Um, mm. Yeah, I remember seeing that. I was listening to it on audio, so I'm like, um, I didn't actually mark it in the thing. But essentially, she basically is like, well, I'm not going to actually say what has happened here. We're just going to like fill in the gap yourself, basically. Um, so 
like it's a slow burn novel and then all of a sudden so much happens and I agree it's probably my major critique of this novel and it's a critique mm. that I've had of other Jane Austens is that yeah puts so much effort into teasing relationships leading you down certain paths building characters building your understanding of why the characters make their decisions and like she really goes into the detail of relationships yeah. And then often it's all like a red herring. And then she like turns around at the very last minute and is like, gotcha, it's going this way instead. Um, exactly. And I think those endings, though you expect them in a lot of cases, like I think in most situations, you know roughly who your character is going to end up with, like quite close to the beginning. And mm. then she takes you on a journey and it's all very fun. But I think they still feel a tad rushed. And I think because... Mm. I was never invested in Edmund and Fanny romantically as a relationship because as we've said they didn't feel like a romantic connection they felt like just you know companions yeah so like I think in that instance the rush of getting them married off at the end just felt like the kind of like the one section where you can't really be invested in it or believe that it's mm. actually because it just feels so like she's tying it in a neat bow for the sake of doing so yeah so. I do I do agree I think like if that was kind of just like you're given a glimpse into a little bit more of what Edmund and Fanny are like as a romantic pairing then I feel like that ending would have been like fine but you're, yeah. you don't really see that um I can see a comment actually someone said it's like the end of a theatre play and yeah. that's quite true because like especially with like Shakespeare like Shakespeare does that as well, where it's like, you know, it's tied in a it's tied in a bow, you know, it's quite like the endings of Shakespeare plays are often like that, where things are, you know, usually there's like a wedding, actually, yeah. in, in the in the comedies. It's kind of like that, where it's just like, okay, yeah. and here's the wedding, tied in a neat bow. We don't really see the wedding, but that's the end of the play. That's it, done. Yeah, um, no, I agree with that. And it's also like there is sometimes in in plays and in this case in the book that kind of breaking of the fourth wall where you're like very aware that there's a narrator telling you a story and it's mm. like kind of like they start to address you more directly as a reader rather than telling you about the characters they're like and now it's up to you to decide what you think happened so it's like yeah you know, I don't hate it and I think it is just typical of how Jane Austen decided to finish up her novel she's like there's the story here's the ending boom enjoy yeah. and like it does work but I think if you were just like to critique them you know like if you were really to dive into like how it works structurally the endings just stand out against the rest of the novel as being rushed because she does such a good job of detail in the rest of them mm. I think they the play the novel I mean yeah. got into the theatre but yeah she does such a great job of detail in the rest of the novels that it just feels like oh we could have had more here or they could have cut exactly. out some earlier on and put more time into the into the ending so yeah but I think that's also kind of indicative of like how good her books are that we mm. want more because we know she could do more so it's like it's yeah kind of, it's a bad thing but also mm. it beca it's because you enjoy her writing so much and you know that she can characterize relationships so well that you wish she did it at the end of the book exactly so. I know I always wish that was Pride and Prejudice like like I just wish that we got a glimpse into what life was like for the for the Darcy's. Like that's just mm -hmm. honestly, if you know, that's why like I read so much Regency romance is just to kind of like get back into that feeling of like just the kind of like like the kind of sweeping romance of it all, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like I wish there was a Pride and Prejudice sequel where they could just be happy and it's mm -hmm. all perfect. I would read that in a heartbeat yeah it would be nice yeah. like it doesn't need to be all about drama like I think there's not actually mm. a huge amount of drama in her novels and actually it's just interesting mm. to see how these people function in society and it's just fun so it would be nice to kind of see like what one of her couples were like as a married couple or like mm. you know I just think that would be fun because I think in Mansfield Park and in Sense and Sensibility both, I found the ending super rushed. Like in Sense and Sensibility, yeah. you literally like, and so-and-so and so-and-so got married, and then so did so-and-so and so-and-so. The end, and it's like, what? Yes, it's so true, I know. Especially with one of the couples 
where I won't give spoilers because obviously it's not a live show for that and I don't know if anyone has read it yes. ability, but we have um a, a big age gap couple and the mm-hmm. female of this couple was always adamant that she was not interested in this man in that sense and then they don't really tell you about why she came around to the idea but all of a sudden they're yeah. married and you're like sorry what? I know I'm not a fan yeah. of that pairing I would just say, say that just now <laughs> it could have it could have worked but she just didn't give us any details to me like again I think it's not having the reasoning to make us invested is makes it just mm. really hard to believe it but yeah um that's interesting because I, I feel yeah. like possibly but equally she seems to have such an insight into like older married couples in the way that the like parents function in a lot of her yeah. novels and you know she also has such an insight into like courtship and romance and mm. I, I believe that was like a huge part of her own life I might be wrong but like no I know she was engaged she was engaged for one night and then broke it off the next day which I find is quite interesting but then like that makes so much sense when you read her novels like especially because she wasn't in love with the person that she got engaged to so I think Mm -hmm. at least that you can see that autobiographical detail about how like especially with Fanny she doesn't want to marry Henry Crawford because she doesn't love him and it's like maybe that was kind of a bit of a autobiographical detail I don't really know when that engagement was I'd have to obviously look it up and see if the timelines correspond but um I find that interesting and I also wonder if like the reason why she writes about older married couples is maybe because like I don't know if that was really the custom in Regency in the Regency era era to write about married couples Mm -hmm. there's a lot of like there's a lot about the kind of um married couples in general like there were still so many rules about being married in terms of like you know you can't dance with your spouse or like you can't dance with your husband like more than I think it's like twice in a ballroom so there's like there's wow. still so many public laws about like not laws but kind of societal norms yeah. about you mustn't show too much affection to your married partner mm. um so I wonder if like it just wouldn't have been done to have that like mm. level of detail I don't know. Maybe, Feel free yeah, to that's, me in the comments. That's a good point, especially because, like, if it was a sequel, you know, she's done so much romance in the lead up to that. If it, if it wasn't sort of customary to show that level of romance once you were married, then they might kind of seem a bit of a uh, a like let down by comparison to the yeah. process. And I also think, you know, as as people in general, like we are drawn to the chase like that's mm. kind of like the most interesting part of like a story whether that is like you know like an action situation or if it's like a mystery situation or if it's a romance situation the yeah. process is what intrigues us the most rather than the mm. actual conclusion so I think it makes sense that that's why she focused on that part of it because there is a mystery there and a sort of intrigue and a sense of like what might happen which I think exactly it's much more exciting isn't it and like I think especially in the Regency era like marriage was the ultimate ideal that so many people Mm -hmm. were aspiring to especially if you're a woman like there's not not much else um so I guess like the readers like the contemporary readers at the time they would have been looking for okay yeah but did they get married at the end so Mm -hmm. I guess like that would be quite representative of like a lot of women's own you know situations in the regency era so maybe that's also a reason but yeah who knows who knows unfortunately we'll never know um but we can keep guessing so that's fine um I'm always here to talk about all the Jane Austen so it's all good I know it's like you don't even realize like I log into these live shows and I'm like I've got a couple of things in my mind but I love just going in and seeing where the conversation goes because I think yeah there are like an infinite number of topics that you could touch on and it's so interesting to see like what comes up in each discussion because there's like mm. so many directions that these conversations could take which I love but I think Definitely. probably on that note having discussed the conclusions and the logic behind Everything. why Jane Austen writes the way that she does that probably brings us to an end on the lovely Mansfield Park which I feel i I like I think this conversation has been very illuminating to me and my opinion yeah. on the novel because I think sometimes 
discussing it with someone else and starting to understand what happened and why mm. really makes your opinion on the book change and like you start to have a lot more appreciation for what goes on so yeah oh, I'm so pleased like this has been so much fun I think Hansel uh-huh. Park is a good one to talk about because like it is very under represented and not yeah. a lot of people have read it you know so... I think what happens with it is like at least, like you say, I don't think a lot of people have read it by comparison to her other ones, which definitely yeah. doesn't help its representation. But I also think an immediate read, you don't feel a love for a lot of the characters. Mm. And you know, in some of her other books, there are so many great characters. So I think when you compare it on like that level, you're like, well, I didn't like the characters. I didn't feel connected to them. I wasn't invested mm. in them. But then when you dive into who they are, or why they function the way that they do and how they interact together, then I think the book has a lot of weight even though the characters yeah. as like individuals don't it has like a lot to it so I think it's just mm. one of those ones you have to like process and then appreciate so yeah exactly definitely amazing okay. well thank you all for joining us I've really yeah, enjoyed discussing Mansfield Park with you all and next month will be Emma which I am so oh, about highlight <laughs> all right bye Bye, everyone.